it's a great privilege to be here with you tonight and to speak with you about bladder cancer. Uh, bladder cancer um, <clears throat> clinics and research occupies a lot of my time and my thoughts, and I believe that holds true also for you, being patients, family, or friends of patients with bladder cancer. So um, <clears throat> being um, engaged with this disease for uh, quite some years, I became uh, <clears throat> very uh, uh, supportive of uh, patients' involvement and education in understanding their own disease and the natural history of the disease. And uh, I believe this is part of getting <clears throat> a cure, actually. So getting involved and knowing more about the disease is certainly something that is, should be uh, encouraged. And I think this organization is terrific, uh, and also by creating these alliances between patients and between patients and their physicians. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, <coughs> get on and try to uh, <coughs> um, summarize for you some of the basic facts with respect to uh, bladder cancer, and those relates to uh, risk factors, diagnosis of bladder cancer, and natural history. All right, so uh, the bladder cancer is quite a common disease. Uh, south of the border in USA, there are about 75,000 uh, cases a year, uh, with about 15,000 uh, deaths from the disease annually. Here in Canada, bladder cancer is the sixth uh, leading cause of new cancer cases each year. Uh, bladder cancer tends to be more common in male, and actually the male to female ratio is about three to one. And there, are, there were some reports that uh, suggested that bladder cancer may be more aggressive in female patients. I would suggest that you will not get too stressed because if you compare stage for stage, grade for grade, there is no much difference in prognosis between male and female. This will relate to something that we will mention later that may be related to delaying diagnosis or referring bladder symptoms in female patients specifically not to bladder cancer, and therefore delaying diagnosis and delaying treatment. Bladder cancer is a disease that uh, we age with nowadays, that <coughs> patients are often, or people are often aged to their 80s and 90s. We see more and more patients with bladder cancer, and that's a whole separate issue uh, and whole separate challenge. How do we, as urologists, as caregivers, are dealing with bladder cancer in octogenarians or in older patients, um, <clears throat> particularly, do we offer them uh, the same treatment? And I would not go into that right now, but I'd be happy to accept questions uh, with respect to that later on. In any case, bladder cancer uh, arises from the epithelial inner leaning of the uh, bladder and the collecting system. And therefore, um, <clears throat> one would expect the carcinogens that are accumulating in the, uh, or excreted in the urine uh, if they have more, uh, uh, if the more exposure that one or the, has to these uh, carcinogens, therefore the more chance of one developing bladder cancer or epithelial, ure, uh, urethelial cancer, and this is what we see with age, the incidence of bladder cancer increases. There are several uh, well-defined risk factors for bladder cancer. Uh, the most um, <clears throat> common one, and actually the most famous one, is obviously smoking. To this date, we do not know what the exact carcinogen in the smoke is. Nevertheless, it's clear that smoking increases the risk of developing bladder cancer. And uh, in epidemiology, we like to uh, call it relative risk. So the risk of a smoker to develop bladder cancer in lifetime is four times that of a non-smoker. The good news are that if one quits smoking within 15 to 20 years, his or her risk to develop bladder cancer decreases to uh, the uh, comparable rates to um, non-smokers. So it takes time, there is a lead time to get, uh, <clears throat> to, get to the same uh, uh, relative risk as non-smoker patients, but smoking is definitely a risk factor for bladder cancer and a risk for recurrence for those who have um, uh, <clears throat> uh, superficial bladder cancer. Bladder cancer can also be associated with chronic irritation, chronic infections in the urine. There are many reasons for that. There is an inflammatory reaction with 
um, white blood cells and bacteria that secretes a lot of uh, compounds that can be carcinogenic. Classically, patients who have a permanent catheter, for example, paraplegic patients, uh, tend to develop bladder cancer. Usually, it's squamous cell histology. Uh, and that happens uh, in, used to be, or those are actually quite uh, anachronistic number, 10% of paraplegic patients or patients with long-term uh, catheterization. Nowadays, with better catheter care, with more attention to this situation, with more careful uh, surveillance, the risk is uh, actually lower. Um, <clears throat> there are some infectious etiologies that are associated with bladder cancer. For example, if you look at the DNA uh, or the genetic material within bladder cancer specimens, in about a third of the case, we can find a DNA of human papilloma virus. This is interesting, and there may be some connection to that. There is a connection, not in this part of the uh, globe, but rather in, uh, in, uh, mainly in Egypt, between uh, infection with schistosoma hematobium, which is a, a kind of a worm, to the development of mainly squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder. This is obviously not common here. There is a very um, tight association between previous therapies for other malignancies, and bladder cancer. So for example, irradiation, while curative to cancer, can by itself <clears throat> create mutations in ad adjacent tissues. For example, female patients that had radiation in the past for cervical cancer are at higher risk to develop bladder cancer up to four times. Same holds through now we know for rectal cancer or prostate cancer patients that have been treated with radiation. If we follow them enough time, there is an increased risk of developing uh, bladder cancer. Patients who were treated with uh, different chemotherapies, and most commonly cyclophosphamide, which is a chemotherapy mainly used for a lymphoma patient, have a very high risk uh, of developing bladder cancer down the road uh, due to some mutagenesis uh, with the metabolites of this uh, uh, chemotherapy that can uh, be accumulated in the urine or secreted to the urine and affect the urethelium. Arsenic is a compound that we all drink in our water, or hopefully in a very low amount, but arsenic by itself it's, uh, is not a carcinogen by itself, but usually together with smoking, with irritation by inflammation or so, can, be, uh, can induce bladder cancer. Renal transplant patients, for some reason, are more uh, susceptible for bladder cancer, and those who have low urine volume, so those who are not drinking much, are potentially more susceptible also to bladder cancer. Cutting of the fluid and so on? Uh, it's something that... Sorry, could you repeat the question? Please? The question was why certain, uh, certain uh, um, occupations are having uh, more uh, incidence of bladder cancer. Is it... What type of exposure do you need uh, to, to get this uh, cancer? So um, the idea is that this... Um, these uh, uh, carcinogens are actually absorbed to the bloodstream. You know that the kidneys, which receive about 10% of our renal blood flow in every given moment, um, <clears throat> do filtrate the, the blood. So the filtration, the filtrate is actually the urine that is, uh, that is generated. And this is going down through the whole collecting system down to the bladder. So in, usually we have more bladder cancer than upper tract cancer because the dwelling time of the urine in the bladder is way longer, so there is more exposure. Um, so we, I, I don't know. So some of the, uh, for example, smoking is not going through, you know, through the, through, uh, through the smoke that goes to the skin or the mucous membrane. It goes through the blood, filtrated there, and goes uh, into the urine. This is just a, a list of uh, different occupations that uh, gives a little bit uh, uh, more risk for bladder cancer, so I hope you can see, but again, we're talking about relative risks. So, for example, hairdresser. Are there any hairdressers here? Okay. <laughs> so hairdressers have 23% more chance of developing bladder cancer compared to patients that are not ha uh, um, hairdressers. You have here me mechanics, motor mechanics, uh, glass makers, uh, printers, all of that because of the exposure to different carcinogens, for, uh, uh, as well as... Uh, Taxi drivers here, um, launderers, um, people who work in, 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 in the rubber industry, etc., etc. So what are the symptoms of bladder cancer? 
So the most important, the most common symptom is hematuria or blood in the urine, okay? So hematuria, hematuria, hematuria. This is the most uh, common symptoms. It's usually macroscopic or gross hematuria, which means that you can see it in your own eyes. It's oftentimes painless. And the most important thing to remember that this is an intermittent phenomenon, namely that you don't have to have it all the time, right? So if you had hematuria, and it stopped, we still need to investigate that, okay? Because the tumor does not bleed all the time. The same holds through for microscopic hematuria, which is the hematuria that is detected only by the microscope or by a deep stick. Unexplained urinary symptoms. If someone has an unexplained burning urgency, frequency, that needs to, be, uh, uh, that needs to get investigated, okay? Oftentimes, I see patients in my office that uh, says to me, well, I had these symptoms, I had a little bit of bleeding, but I have this urgency and, 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 and burning, and I, this was referred by my physician as a urinary tract infection. I was treated with antibiotics here and there and so forth. You have to remember, there is no UTI or no urinary tract infection without a causative agent, so usually it's bacteria, okay? So you have to have a urine culture that backs up bladder symptoms of urinary tract infection. Otherwise, it's not a urinary tract infection. It may be something else. A stone there, some, some I don't know, uh, um, <coughs> irritative, uh, or, 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 um, irritative symptoms by, by stone, by, by, by tumor, by many other reasons. But urinary tract infection has to be backed up by, bladder, uh, by, by urine culture. Flank pain can occur. And this occurs either if there is a tumor in the collecting system, okay, that blocks the kidney, or sometimes if the tumor is just over the orifice of the kidney, okay? So here, for example, you can see a, an MRI of a patient with a huge tumor here just at the angle where the ureter is joining the bladder, and this has been causing not, not only hematuria, but significant back pain or flank pain that has been referred. Very important uh, thing to remember, the collecting system starts here at the calluses, and this is leaned by the same, by the same um, transitional cell epithelium as the bladder and sometimes as the urethra. So it's, if you have an exposure to carcinogen, it's a field effect, okay? So there is a chance that you will have lesions in your upper tract and in different areas of your bladder. It's not just one spot. So should we screen for bladder cancer? Screen or not to screen? And this is a, a, a great question. So if one talks about screening, the, the idea behind screening is to detect the disease before uh, it becomes too late, if you wish, or be, when it, the time is to, it, it's, it's treatable, okay? And before you get any symptoms. But there are problems with that. And the problem is that there is a very short latency time between the initiation of bladder cancer and symptoms, okay? And how do we know that? So, for example, if you take and do an autopsy on people that uh, die from car accidents or, or whatsoever that had no bladder symptoms, you rarely find an incidental bladder cancer, which means that there is a very short, what we call latency period of bladder cancer from initiation to the, uh, <coughs> from the initiation of the tumor to the uh, appearance of symptoms. The other problem is that bladder cancer biology is not really a tumor that the develop uh, in, um, in a continuum. So for example, if you have a colon cancer, this starts from a hyperplasia, then a polyp, then an adenoma, then get, that gets to a tumor, which then invades and so forth, as you can see here. Bladder cancer is a bit different. So there are lesions in the bladder that are pre-malignant or can be associated with later development of invasive bladder cancer, for example, carcinoma in situ or high-grade um, uh, T1 disease. But usually, the connection between TA disease, between superficial tumors, or even T1, is not that great with invasive bladder cancer. So you cannot really follow a continuum of disease and say, well, I detected TA, wow, now it's good, you know, I can prevent invasive bladder cancer. In fact, most of the invasive bladder cancer that we detect are de novo invasive bladder cancer, namely new invasive from the get-go cancers. There's also uh, issues that relate to cost, how much money it will take to uh, test people at risk, and compliance. I'm sure none, none of you is very f uh, fond of uh, cystoscopies, although you probably had a lot of them. So what do we do? How do we solve that? So I think the most important thing is 
to pull the trigger to screen, or not to screen, or, or to at least to, to investigate when the first symptom appears. So generally, if, if one has gross hematuria, one sees the hematuria in his own eyes, there's a, up to 12% chance that one will be discovered with bladder cancer. With microscopic hematuria, namely the doctor tells you, well, I found some red blood cell in your urine and so forth, there's about 4% chance that bladder cancer will be identified. So probably this is a kind of screening. And how do, how do we do that? Usually the gold standard for diagnosis is cystoscopy, and I'm sure most of you are uh, familiar with that uh, uh, examination. Uh, in male, we nowadays do it with a flexible scope, so it's like a tiny catheter that goes in with a, with a fiber optic tube. And those of you, I believe it's here at the Joe's as well, you can actually see your own bladder on the TV. It's projected there, and you can see your own tumor. And what we're looking at is tumors, and here's a classical example of a tumor, coral-like lesion uh, at coming uh, out from the leaning, from the epithelium of the uh, bladder. There are some urine markers uh, to detect bladder cancer. Um, the gold standard is cytology. What we do is we take urine, either voided urine or urine that we take after instrumentation. Uh, <clears throat> this uh, is sent to the laboratory. The uh, sediment is separated. And the pathologist is looking at the sediment, looking at cells that are uh, there. And what you can see is, for example, here, you can see a clamp of malignant cells. How do we know that they are malignant? Well, they have a very bizarre shape. They have very large nuclei. The nucleus of the cells are where the genetic material or the DNA is accumulating. There are lots of uh, mitosis here, so you can see a lot of tiny dots here that are um, nucleolized that are very active, okay? So cytology is a marker which uh, has a sensitivity of about 60%, which means that 60% of the patients with bladder cancer, sorry, 60% of the patients that have a positive cytology will, uh, um, so 60% of those who have bladder cancer will have a positive cytology. Why not 100%? Because cytology is not that sensitive for low-grade tumor. Low-grade tumor are more benign-like and the cytology will not be that pronounced. On the other hand, those high-grade tumors Cytology is quite sensitive for them, and the specificity, which means those who have negative tests that are really negative, is approaching 100%. So for us, it's a good marker, at least for an aggressive disease. And I believe, I at least, and I believe Dr. Shagan as well, uses it as an adjunctive test. So we want to know, not only that we have cancer, even if we identify, do we have a positive cytology? Because that will lead us to examine um, potentially the upper tracts, potentially uh, other sides of the bladder. There are, <clears throat> during the years, a lot of people try to develop urinary markers to potentially uh, spare cystoscopy from patients because obviously cystoscopy is an invasive procedure. Um, there are many uh, urine markers that have been on trials. Uh, they all kind of fell out of favor because they have, don't have um, high enough sensitivity. One of the markers that is still uh, out there is NMP22. Uh, this is a <clears throat> nuclear matrix protein. It's a protein that is uh, expressed in cancer cells and tends to shed to the urine. So it's a kind of like a pregnancy test, if you wish. Uh, you put your urine here. If you get uh, the line here, the positive line here, there are, the NMP test is positive. Yet, it doesn't mean that you do have uh, bladder cancer necessarily, because if you have significant bleeding at the time or you have active urinary tract infection, that be, may be, sorry, false positively, um, um, read a false positive, but you do have also false negative. Bear in mind, again, the epithelium, the leaning of the collecting system and the bladder is the same histology. It's susceptible for the same carcinogens, okay? So if we find tumor in the bladder, we as urologists must investigate at least once the upper tract, so sometimes we, we can do it. Here's, for example, we, we do a ret oops, what do they do? A, a, retrograde, a retrograde injection of contrast to the uh, collecting system, and what you can see here is that uh, these are nice scalices that are opacify very nicely here. There is a filling defect because there is a compression from the outside of a tumor. And the ureter and the collecting system has the same uretilium. Okay, so patients with bladder cancer have up to 5% chance of developing upper tract cancer. And this is true even after we take bladder out. Okay, so there's still chance for recurrence in the upper tract. 
as well as those who have discovered with upper tract TCC or transitional cell carcinoma have up to 75% chance of having subsequent bladder cancer. So this is the reason why we survey these patients uh, for the bladder with repeat cystoscopy, etc. Let's talk a little bit about delay in diagnosis because I'm sure some of you have been uh, familiar with that uh, or at least with the noise that this may create in the news. So uh, it has been uh, published in recently that uh, uh, on a, a national database in the States that if you take patients that uh, from the time of their symptoms, okay, from the hematuria uh, so, uh, to the time that were, they were diagnosed, if you, uh, prov uh, if you divide it into patients that had the diagnosis within three months and those who had it between 9 to 12 months, those who had it between 9 to 12 months have 34% uh, morta mortality uh, rate from bladder cancer. That should be alarming. Yet, I don't want you to get so stressed because it may be that there is what we call a bias here, a lead time bias. So let's take two patients, okay? This is patient A, patient B. <clears throat> patient, they both have their epithelial cell getting the mutagenesis here and die from the bladder cancer here. And this is the times in between, okay? So it's the same time. Yet, the time from symptoms that uh, started here, um, it's time from diagnosis that was earlier here to here is longer, but the survival is not long. So we don't know really if we, if we do find it earlier, this is indeed affecting the, um, the, uh, the, the stage of the disease. It may be a surrogacy of uh, a better care. So if those health system where you find the cancer earlier have better care or better setup that can uh, be associated with better, uh, better survival. And I will talk about it in a second. So what do we do? So we, we find the bladder cancer, as you could see uh, in the uh, cystoscopy. Then the next phase is what we call TORBT, or transuteral resection of bladder tumor. And what we do here is this is done now under uh, anesthesia, either spinal or, or general. And what we do is uh, we take a, a special uh, um, endoscopic uh, 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 instrument that has a, this loop and we cauterize and resect the tumor. And importantly, we want to sample the muscle layer that is below the epithelium, okay? So here we can see that we resect piecemeal and we get here, you see no more tumor. This is the epithelium here and we do have to get a strip of muscle. And why is that important? Because we need to understand the relationship of the tumor to the bladder wall, okay? So, for example, here you can see a normal urethelium, okay? So this is the urethelium, okay? This is the sub-urethelial uh, layer, so um, <clears throat> the lamina propria, and you can see a nice, very organized uh, structure of, 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 of epithelial cells. This is, for example, a different story. This is what we call carcinoma. Inside, you see a very angry, disorganized, multiple cells, different orientation of the cells, and this is what we call carcinoma in situ. Here, you can see the lamina propria, or the subepithelial tissue, is completely preserved, yet there is a lot of hyperplasia and a neoplastic uh, process here. This is usually the TA uh, disease, the, these polyps, like you saw before, that has cancer, but this is superficial. It does not go into the... Uh, uh, subepithelial layer. This is a tumor that invades into the muscle. You can see here, those of you who have a <clears throat> potentially some imagination can see here muscle fibers and this tumor is invading into the <clears throat> bladder wall. And for us it's critical to understand both the grade and the stage of the tumor. How aggressive it looks in terms of its ar architecture and how deep it goes because that will affect our uh, treatment. And the key here is to differentiate between those cancer who behave aggressively and, uh, and uh, are risk to one's uh, survival than those who are just immune. So there are tumors that are there, they tend to recur, but they are superficial and rarely progress to a disease that will uh, risk uh, one's longevity, so not to a, a, a muscle invasive disease. So at diagnosis, up to 30% or 25%, are like the tigers. Those are the invasive bladder cancer. Those are either already metastasis, metastatic or are not metastatic but are <clears throat> at risk to become metastatic very, very uh, soon and we need to treat them aggressively. About 40% of the tumors uh, at diagnosis uh, 
are low-grade tumors. They are what we call a papillary tumor in neoplasia uh, with low malignant potential. And these are the pussycats, okay? Yes, they tend to recur up to 70% in five years, but they rarely progress. We have, a bit, <clears throat> we have a challenge with those cats that start to develop these uh, uh, nails and can become a tigers. And those are the T1, the high-grade T1 tumors. Those are the superficial tumors because they didn't go yet into the muscle layer, but they may go there. And up to 50%, they may develop progression to muscle invasive disease. And the CIS, OK? So this one is a pussycat right now, but it may be very well associated with a tiger or develop to become a, a tiger by itself. This one would probably stay a pussycat, OK? So here you can see just the trajectories. So uh, the frequency we talked about, uh, you see that the progression rate is very, very low for those uh, superficial low-grade tumors. And it's quite high for those who are uh, um, <clears throat> high-grade uh, uh, um, cancer, up to 60% uh, uh, for uh, those who are uh, T1 disease. So one word on delay of treatment. So we're not sure yet about delaying diagnosis. Obviously, we think that diagnosing the cancer earlier is very important. And therefore, I would go back and stress you all not to relate to your unexplained urinary symptoms as urinary tract infection, at least if you don't have a positive urine culture. But once we have the diagnosis, there is probably an association between prompt treatment and usually the timeline that we like to refer to for muscle invasive diseases, three months' time from the time of diagnosis to the time of cystectomy. Dr. Shagan here will, I believe, talk about uh, um, <clears throat> neoadjuvant chemotherapy, so this is not counting into, but th at least the time that we start to refer to this tumor as uh, invasive bladder cancer and treat it. For high risk non muscle invasive bladder cancer, so high risk recurrent T1 disease or high risk recurrent refractory carcinoma in situ, we suggest a cutoff of four months. So uh, I think uh, this will segue us nicely to uh, Dr. Shagan's uh, uh, talk, which will concentrate more on treatment. And please uh, um, let me welcome uh, Dr. Shagan, a friend and colleague of mine uh, here from St. Joseph.